afternoon, everyone. Good morning, maybe to some. Uh, my name is Keisha Pollock Porter, and I am the chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I have the great privilege and honor of moderating today's webinar, and I thank you all for being here with us. In our time together today, we are going to have a conversation around public carrying of firearms, really understanding the impact of the recent Supreme Court's decision. You're here because you are aware that in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, really the most consequential Second Amendment case since 2008, the Supreme Court struck down a piece of New York's concealed carry permitting law. And in doing so, the court specifically noted that the Second Amendment protects a right to carry a gun in public and really reshapes the way all courts must evaluate gun laws moving forward. Clearly, this decision has implications for, for policy and the law, and especially for public health. And we're really going to unpack that today. We have a great set of panelists. I will briefly introduce them. We will hear from each of them and then we will have time for questions. I want to encourage you to post your questions using the Q&A function, and we will get to as many as we can during our time together today. So let me go ahead and introduce the panelists. Eric Rubin is an assistant professor of law at Southern Methodist University Denman School of Law. His current scholarship explores the regulation of violence and weapons, and how that regulation intersects with self-defense and Second Amendment rights. Amy Chavis is a professor of law and founder and director of the Center for Criminal Justice Policy and Reform at the William and Mary School of Law. She has substantial practice experience and writes and teaches related in areas related to criminal law, criminal procedure, and criminal justice reform. Alex McCourt is an assistant professor and director of legal research at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solution. He examines firearm policy, opioid policy, and other areas affected by the relationships between law and the public's health. And Kelly Roscombe is the director of law and policy at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions. He studies the constitutional implications of advocates for and works to improve the implementation of firearm laws. We have an outstanding group of panelists today, and we're going to begin by hearing from Kelly, who's going to present an overview of the opinion, highlighting what the case was about and what the court ruled. Let me turn it over to Kelly. Thank you so much, Keisha. Um, New York law prohibits possession of a firearm in public without a license. In order to get an unrestricted license to carry in public, an applicant must, among other things, show proper cause. They must articulate a need to protect themselves that is distinguishable from the general population. For example, a specific threat to their safety. Two individuals in Rensselaer County, New York, sought unrestricted licenses to carry, but were issued restricted licenses to carry to and from work, and for hunting and target shooting instead because they did not show proper cause. They challenged the law in a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. In a six to, six to three decision written by Justice Clarence Thomas, a majority of the Supreme Court found that the proper cause requirement for concealed carry licenses in New York violated the second and the 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution. They also declared an individual right to carry a handgun in public for self-defense, expanding the right to possess in the home that was previously declared in a 2008 case called District of Columbia versus Heller, which recognized this individual right for the first time. For over a decade since Heller, lower courts evaluating Second Amendment cases have applied a two-part test. At part one, courts rely on history to determine if the law at issue burdens the Second Amendment at all. So they look to the way we have historically regulated firearms. At part two, the courts determine if the law is appropriately tailored to achieve an important 
or compelling government interest like public safety. So they're looking to see if it is over-inclusive, covers people that do not present a risk of public uh, to the public safety, and under-inclusive, if it covers not enough people who present a risk to public safety with firearms. And it is at this second part that courts consider evidence-based research to show how effective a law is at protecting public safety and reducing gun violence. They consider research like that conducted by my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins. In perhaps the most consequential part of Bruin, the court abandoned this two-part test and stated that courts must now use a test that relies exclusively on text, history, and tradition. To satisfy this test, the government must show that the law at issue is either identical to or sufficiently analogous to an historical firearm law. However, the court provides very little guidance to lower courts on how to apply the test. For example, what makes a law sufficiently analogous to an historical law, especially where we're facing challenges that are different or more expansive than those that were faced in the founding era. The majority stated that the test based on history is, in their view at least, more legitimate, more administrable than judges asking, judges than asking judges to make difficult empirical judgments about the costs and benefits of firearm restrictions, especially given their lack of expertise in the field. In a concurring opinion, Justice Alito also suggests that a text history and tradition test is more objective than the two-part test. However, though judges may lack expertise in empirical research, they also lack expertise in the field of history. And a new test, this text history and tradition test, may prove to be more rather than less subjective than the two-part test. In applying the text history and tradition test in this case, Justice Breyer notes in his dissent that the majority in each instance finds a reason to discount the historical evidence's persuasive force. So the litigants trying to uphold New York's law presented a great deal of evidence of historical firearm regulations that were either identical to or very analogous to the law at issue in New York. But for one reason or another, the majority finds that that is insufficient to uphold New York's law. We're going to hear from our other panelists in greater detail about some of the difficulties of applying this text history and tradition test to other modern firearm regulations. Thanks so much, Keisha. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. As, as the one non-lawyer in the group, I found that very clear. So I appreciate that you unpacked that for us to really understand what was really, what, what is the, the crux, what's at the core of the Bruin, Bruin decision. So thank you for that. Um, I, I wanna turn to Eric next. And Eric, I'm wondering if you can share with us the, the impact of the Bruin ruling on other gun violence prevention laws from, from what, what your perspective is on this. Sure, thanks so much for including me in this discussion. I'm really happy to be here. As Kelly mentioned so um, eloquently, this is a really important decision. And I think that it's going to have far reaching implications for the way that Second Amendment cases get litigated going, going um, uh, into the future. Now, as Kelly noted, Justice Clarence Thomas's majority opinion adopts a new test for evaluating const the constitutionality of gun laws. And this is an ostensibly historical approach. According to the court, the constitutional the constitutionality of modern day gun violence uh, regula uh, gun regulations that are seeking to address modern day gun violence problems will depend solely on whether they are in some ill-defined sense analogous to historical regulations. And the temporal focus for the historical regulations is around the time of the Second Amendment's enactment back in 1791 or maybe into the 1800s. This test I expect to be heavily critiqued in the coming months and years because as Kelly mentioned, it invites a heck of a lot of judicial discretion. So I wanna do a couple of things over the, the next few minutes. First, I'll talk about the problem of judicial discretion as I see it unfolding in specific cases. And then I'll loop back to how modern day public health empirics 
will continue to play a role in litigation, even if it's a little bit unclear how in the Bruin decision. And I'll say at the outset that despite a lot of this uncertainty, I don't expect this case to doom public health regulations to prevent gun violence going um, into the future. Now, I'll start with the, the issue of judicial discretion. Now, there are thousands of historical gun laws. There are lots of them. But since they are historical, they were enacted in response to different problems than we have now. They were enacted at times when AR-15s didn't exist and large capacity magazines didn't exist and modern handguns didn't exist. Days after the decision, a case was filed in the District of Columbia challenging a prohibition on guns in the metro. So let's take that as an example. How is the court supposed to determine whether or not the modern day regulation of firearms in the District of Columbia metro is constitutional by looking to historical analogs? Is the prohibitions on guns in the metro station relevantly similar in analysis to historical regulations that did exist that barred guns in fairs and markets? Is it analogous because a lot of people gather both in the metro and in fairs and markets? Or is it disanalogous unless you can find a historical law that specifically targeted firearms in transit stations? Maybe, I don't know, public carriage houses, if those existed. I don't know if they existed. I'm not a historian of public tr transportation. But you can see how even in this case that it was filed just days after Bruin, there will be disputes about what sorts of analogs, historically speaking, are relevantly similar and analogous to modern day restrictions on guns in public transport. Now, part of the one is that analogical reasoning only works if the analogs are relevantly similar. Deciding what makes an historical an analog relevantly similar is going to be key to applying this new historical test that Bruin sets out. And it, it invites a lot of judicial discretion. As legal scholar Frederick Schauer once observed in an article about analogical reasoning, quote, a blue car is in some respects like a blue coat. And in those respects, it's unlike a red car. Everything is similar to everything else in some ways and dissimilar from everything else in other ways. So what metric will judges apply to decide on relevant similarity? The majority provides little guidance, but in a telling paragraph, they suggest how modern day public health empirics might continue to play a role. The court says that in difficult cases, judges should inquire, quote, how and why the regulations burden a law-abiding citizen's right to armed self-defense. How and why the historical analog burdened the right to armed self-defense and how and why the modern day regulation burdens the right to armed self-defense. Of course, there's lots of room for cherry picking here. And I think that Kelly laid this out quite well in the court's own analysis of historical public carry regulations. And there were lots of them. The court dismissed one after another. Some, were dissimilar because they were too far before the Second Amendment got enacted. Some were not analogous because they took effect too long after the Second Amendment was enacted. Some were too Texan. It will surprise a lot of people, I, I think, that Texas historically had a lot of public carry regulations. In fact, there was a general prohibition with few exceptions on public carry from 1791, all the, I'm sorry, from 1871, all the way into the 1990s. Some, according to the court, weren't enforced enough. So after playing whack-a-mole with all these historical regulations, the court then concluded that New York's regulation did not have any relevantly similar historical analogs. It was an outlier and therefore it was unconstitutional. One of the things that the analysis suggests is that the level of generality at which you apply this analogical reasoning is going to be, in some cases, outcome determinative. So consider, for example, that in many um, that at the time of the founding, at the time of um, the Second Amendment's enacted, enactment, there were historical gun laws that applied strict rules restricting the access of firearms for Native Americans and also for those who refused to sign a loyalty oath. What does that tradition reflect? Does it, does it reflect solely that those specific categories of people can be disarmed or that anyone we deem dangerous today and that dangerousness could be shored up by public health empirics, can be disarmed. Are domestic abusers today relevantly similar to those disarmed groups back in 1791? 
or are they not? Because after all, in 1791, wives had few, if any, rights against abusive spouses. Under the doctrine of coverture, they were essentially property of their husbands. So shifting to the question about modern day public health empirics, what is its role in litigation going forward? Of course, I think that it will continue to be massively important on the public policy side. It will continue to be very important as we enact sound policies to show that they're empirically grounded. But I also expect that they'll continue to play a role in litigation. How prominently they will is yet to be seen. So returning again to the two metrics that the court said are important in deciding whether or not a historical analog is sufficient to shore up a modern day gun regulation, courts are supposed to look to how and why a given regulation burdens armed self-defense. Answering that question will be easier with modern day evidence about gun violence and related solutions. Why do we disarm domestic violence misdemeanors? Well, because the evidence shows us that a gun in the home can increase the risk of homicide in a domestic violence situation by up to 500%. Are those regulations effective at reducing that harm? That also goes into why we are passing modern day gun violence regulations. So in cases like that, I expect judges will consider both history and modern day empirics. In the coming years, I think that there's going to be a deluge of litigation. Gun rights advocates, because of this Bruin decision, because of the, for the reasons that Kelly already set out, are going to have, have an open door to challenging a new gun regulations that have been upheld after Heller. There have been over 1,400 challenges to gun laws since 2008 when Heller came down, and I'd expect a similar quantity of challenges in the coming decade or so. We'll likely see that empirics will continue to feature in that litigation, even if their express role after Bruin is uncertain. I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take more specific questions in, uh, in, in the question and answer period. Thank you again for having me on. Great, thank you so much, Eric, for um, lifting up that, that historical perspective and, and the implications of this decision for, for policy and for other laws. Um, I wanna shift to, to Cami now, and, and Cami just would really like to hear from you what you believe are the equity implications of the Bruin case. Thank you, thank you for, for having me. You know, on its face, the opinion, when you read through the opinion, it may not seem like it would have a disproportionate impact on communities of color, but uh, we, we really have to, to, to dig in and, and to think about the unintended consequences of uh, an opinion like this. You know, some advocates have even suggested that because the opinion curtails uh, the discretion in these licensing schemes, that it could be beneficial for uh, communities of color. And I think that, I think that's a, a valid question, but I think that that really, that remains to be seen. And I think that there's enough history since the court has so focused on history. I think there's enough history here um, to tell us that um, that's likely not the case. Uh, I think that we are going to see um, some uh, important equity considerations. Uh, what's of immediate concern is how this decision and the implications of this decision will interact with other laws and policies that are already in effect and other laws and policies that we already know are having um, disparate um, effects and disadvantages for uh, communities of color, people uh, of color. So um, first, um, you know, in, in the last, I think it's really important and, uh, and, and Kelly uh, mentioned some of this, but you know, in the last few years, there have been multiple, I think over a dozen empirical studies that show that right to carry laws increase violent crime. Um, and, you know, there, there was one um, study by uh, some Duke and Stanford uh, researchers um, that showed in states adopting these right to carry laws, um, they experienced, some of the cities experienced 30, a 30% 30 increase in firearm related violent crime. And that, that crime could be robberies, could be burglaries, those types of things. So if we sit with that for a minute, and this is what we know, and this is what is so important, all of the 
the, when we're thinking about the public health uh, implications, all of the trauma associated with uh, people who are, are victims of, of violent crime, um, that's really important. And so for the court to abandon the tests that had already uh, been, um, been, been used for so many years and to focus on this historical analysis uh, really, uh, I think, flies in the face of what a lot of policymakers uh, and public health advocates uh, would suggest. Um, I will point out that this is not the first time we've seen the United States Supreme Court ignore really important empirical evidence, particularly where um, race um, is is concerned. Uh, when we think back to the McCleskey decision with capital punishment, the courts, they, they considered it. Yes, we have all of this em empirical evidence showing us that our criminal justice system uh, is biased in so many ways and, and thinking about capital punishment and still, uh, you know, again, uh, 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 discarded uh, that information. And I think decades uh, of, of living with that has, again, shown us that um, these disparities are, um, are, are real. So um, we might see um, that the other concern um, is that not only this concern of violent crime uh, in general, but when we're thinking about in particular communities of color, I'm really concerned about how this opinion and the, and the policies will interact with other laws such as stand your ground. Okay, so, and if we go back to, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, the stand your ground um, the laws, but essentially these are statutory laws that expand uh, an individual's right to use self-defense. So under the common law, um, you, you had a right to self-defense um, in, in your home. And if you could safely retreat, uh, or even outside of your home, if you could safely retreat and, and de-escalate the situation, you are bound to do so. And not doing so would um, would negate your ability to have uh, the, the defense of, of self-defense. So these statutory laws, of course, increase that and say you don't have um, a duty to retreat. You can stand your ground uh, and go fight. And so why am I mentioning this law when we're talking about it? completely different decision. Well, it's because when you have more firearms uh, and more firearm related violence, um, and you have many laws, and these laws are proliferating in a number of, um, of states, um, then you're likely to, again, uh, disincentivize people to, to de-escalate. They have their firearm, and they, there's a law in the book saying that they don't have to retreat and they can use it. So it's a really dangerous combination. And these laws uh, also have been shown to increase homicides and firearm um, and uses of, of firearms in those situations. What is particularly concerning is the racial, again, the racial disparities that we see uh, in the use of uh, with, with stand your ground laws. And I can throw out anecdotal names. People are uh, very familiar with what happened to Trayvon Martin and what happened to Ahmaud Arbery. And it, with the Ahmaud Arbery case, we actually um, see that those that the particular individuals involved were found guilty of hate crimes, um, of, of federal uh, hate crimes, of violating federal hate crimes laws. So when we're at a time in, and, and, I, and again, I'm going back to these unintended consequences. We have to really think about this. If we think about the context of the time that we're in and we're seeing uh, increases in violent crime, we are seeing an increase in extremist uh, rhetoric and violence. And uh, again, I think the, in the January 6th committee hearings have told us um, about, uh, has, have, uh, again, I think, open, uh, shed light uh, on the, the work of the of many extremist groups and the fact that many of them were armed and, 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 and ready um, at the Capitol. So uh, we, we bring all of this up into context and we just have a very dangerous combination of stand your ground laws, which are proliferating in states, which we know have, um, and, and by the way, I should just mention that um, these laws that that again allow individuals to um, 
to forego de-escalation and, and shoot first, uh, so to speak, um, and they, they immunize uh, the shooters from criminal liability, we see the, the racial disparities in the application. Um, Blacks who uh, want to avail themselves of stand around laws have not been able to do so, uh, whereas whites um, are many more times um, able to justify um, their the, the, the killing of a of, of black victim. And so again, there, there are plenty of empirical studies, but um, as we see that that may not be of interest to, uh, to the court. So uh, we've just got a really uh, dangerous combination uh, here. And I, I guess I'd just like to, um, to end um, by saying, uh, we need to be mindful of unintended consequences. We need more studies. So despite the Supreme Court's uh, discarding this empirical evidence and not allowing the, 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 the test, rolling back the, the use of the, the two-part test, um, we should continue to study the effects because I think it will be uh, of interest to legislators policymakers, and we have to continue to study this and we have to, and again, the states that, that, um, that did not have um, these very permissive uh, laws in the first place are the states that have the low, the least amount of gun violence. And so the, the correlation there, where is the correlation? We need to continue to study these impacts. We need to figure out the, the impact of this decision and we need to work legislatively. There are, Elijah, I know that uh, I think Alex probably talked more about this, but there are a lot of things that we can still do to curb uh, gun violence, but this decision is very concerning. Yeah, thank you so much, Cami, for lifting up the, that we need to consider these unintended consequences, and, and we'll certainly have more time to unpack that, so thank you. And I, I've noticed there's a number of questions being posted and sent in, so please continue to do so. Uh, I'm going to turn to our next panelist, and Alex, I'd love to hear from you about the public health implications of Bruin, and what, what does this really mean for gun violence outcomes? Thank you so much. I, I'm really happy to be part of this panel. Um, there are many public health implications, both short-term and long-term, of the court's decision in Bruin. <clears throat> the court really um, did not use public health evidence or social science evidence in, in reaching its majority opinion. Um, in fact, in the concurring opinion, Justice Alito was, was um, outright dismissive of, of the empirical connections between some of these laws and um, outcomes, including mass shootings and suicides. And so it's difficult to say moving forward what the relevance of public health will be. But I think what the point that, that Eric raised, I think is a really important one, that this will continue to be important. Public health evidence will continue to be important in developing and implementing policy, but also in litigation. It will, it will still play a role, even if we don't know exactly what it will look like. So with my time, I thought it would be useful to talk about what that research tells us, what we actually know about the laws that were at issue in, uh, in Bruin, but also about um, a, a broader set of, of gun laws and, and what those implications might be. So when we're talking about Bruin, we're talking about public carry laws. And most of the time we're talking about laws that, that regulate public carry. We're talking about concealed carry. Traditionally, you have had to get a permit to, to carry a concealed handgun. This is true now in about half of the states. About half of the country, you have to get uh, a permit to uh, carry a concealed weapon. In most of these states, there's a set of criteria, and if you meet those criteria, you get the gun, you get the permit and can carry. There's not, uh, there's not much discretion, if any at all. In a handful of states, like New York, there's some discretion. Some licensing officials or the state has discretion to deny you, even if you meet those baseline criteria. In the other half of the states, in 25 states, a permit is not required. So in these states, as long as you are, say, 21 and, and can legally own a gun, you can carry that gun concealed in public. This is not uh, a a kind of policy environment that has been around for very long. In uh, over the past 30 years, we've seen pretty rapid 
uh, deregulation of concealed carry. Back in the 1980s, it was much more strictly regulated. There were many states that banned concealed carry entirely, and there were many more states that afforded discretion to law enforcement and other state officials. That has changed uh, very quickly, both toward more um, what we call shall issue or right to carry laws, and also toward permitless carry laws. Permitless carry in particular has become much more prevalent over the last decade. Um, in 2010, there were just uh, three states that allowed permitless carry, and there are now 25. So what researchers have done is take advantage of these changes. We've seen so many states change their laws that we've been able to look at these changes and say, how did this change affect gun violence? And what we've found is fairly striking. So research done by us here at Johns Hopkins and, and elsewhere has found that there are increases in some measures of violent crime when states move to these less restrictive concealed carry laws. John Donahue at Stanford, along, uh, along with some co-authors, has found in multiple rigorous studies that this can cause up to a 15% increase in violent crime. And this 15% is present even 10 years out. So it's not just an immediate effect or an immediate spike, but something that can occur in aggregate and can continue increasing after a law is adopted. Dr. Mitch Doucette, who is one of my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins, has a couple of different studies looking at these laws. One that has found that when states adopt these permitless carry laws, there are actually some increases in shootings by police. He's also found, however, that when states do have these shall issue laws or these right to carry laws that may um, cause uh, increases in violent crime, there are certain standards that mitigate those increases. So when states require training or when they prohibit carrying by people convicted of a violent misdemeanor, those increases in violent crime are not quite as severe. And that paper um, is forthcoming very shortly. Finally, a really important piece of this research is that uh, these standards for concealed carry are popular. Um, in public opinion research led by uh, Dr. Cass Grafossi, who uh, is also at Johns Hopkins, we found that these policies are very popular. Most people, including gun owners, think that standards for gun carrying are a good idea, including training, and that we shouldn't be allowing carry in, in some of these sensitive places. So with this evidence in mind, what does that mean after Bruin? Well, New York had one of these so-called May issue laws where the state had a lot of discretion. Now that some of that discretion has gone away with this proper cause uh, requirements uh, being ruled unconstitutional, we may see some upticks in, um, in violence or in violent crime in New York and in other states that are adopting these laws because they're effectively, in some ways, moving closer to a right to carry law. They're not moving to permitless. A permit is still required, but they're moving to a, a less restrictive law. So we may see increases. But as our, as our forthcoming research shows, there are things that states can do to try to mitigate those increases, including um, uh, training requirements and limiting access to permits for those who have a history of violence. We also may see increasing uh, uh, violent violent crime rates over time. That's something that, that um, as I mentioned, John Donahue found that when states move, the, move to a less restrictive scheme, there are it's an increasing increase. We see an aggregate increase. So we may see these changes, even if we, we mitigate them a little bit with some standards. But we also might see other laws struck down under this new standard for Second Amendment cases. And these might include laws that are evidence-based that we've found to be related to um, reductions in gun violence, including um, laws requiring a permit to purchase, for example. There's, a, there's a, a close relationship between permits to purchase and permits to carry. So there's a question of how um, the Supreme Court and other courts will view that. And so how, do, how are courts going to evaluate this evidence and how are they going to, to use it, I think is... Um, a lingering question, and it's difficult to know exactly how that will 
work, if they will do it explicitly in some way, or if it will be uh, less, uh, less immediately clear, more implicit, that they're considering it and then shaping their opinion, cherry picking history to, um, to reach decisions that actually support public health. The test is so unclear that I think that there are some courts that could go either way. One really important thing that that I think um, I, I want to emphasize is that this is not, uh, there's reason for optimism after this opinion. Research shows us that we have many evidence-based strategies for working to reduce gun violence, and the vast majority of them were not struck down by this opinion or not explicitly ruled unconstitutional by this opinion. Most evidence-based uh, strategies are still in place and can still be adopted by states. These include gun policies like permits of purchase or extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws. These also include um, community-based programs and interventions that have received more and more funding um, in certain states and, and localities. It also includes things like lethal means counseling and strategies for reducing suicide where people learn how to store their guns responsibly and safely. And finally, it includes social policies, policies that don't directly deal with guns or gun ownership, but instead deal um, with the conditions that foster uh, gun violence, you know, that foster a socioeconomic environment that might lead to increases in gun violence. So the sky is not falling. There are many strategies, even in the wake of Bruin, that, that state and federal lawmakers can take to reduce gun violence. Thank you so much, Alex, for those comments. And um, I'm so excited to go to the Q&A and I wanna just acknowledge the team that is sorting through all the questions. And again, we'll get to as many as we can today and where possible, I'll direct a question to one of the panelists so that we can try to answer these as, as quickly as possible. I also wanna acknowledge that resources are being dropped into the chat. Um, so for example, Alex mentioned a couple of papers and so thanks to the team that post, uh, posted links to those, to those um, articles. Um, so actually, I want to start, Alex, with you first with a with a question about where you just ended up, right? So you just spent some time saying the sky isn't falling. We, we still can be hopeful. And, you know, you talked about these evidence-based strategies that, that we see being challenged by the law or supported by the law are still, still relevant. And so I wanted to just begin with a question about that. Can you share with us what evidence-based strategies are most at risk of legal challenges? Which ones are you most concerned about? And, and the second part of that is if those laws are struck down, how will that affect gun violence? I think I'm, I'm most concerned about laws that have um, similar levels of discretion. So laws that um, there are some states that require a person to, for example, be a suitable person to be licensed. That seems very similar to a proper cause requirement to me. Um, there's very limited research on those provisions, however. They're, um, they're a little old. It's difficult to see how they will affect gun violence, but I think those are, those are the most at risk. Then there are laws that have, um, that uh, place similar restrictions on on gun ownership or, or behavior with guns, like a permit to purchase law that's so similar to a permit to carry law, where states are making decisions about who can purchase a gun and who can't. I think we may see challenges to those laws and, and they may be at risk. And this would be uh, especially concerning because these laws are some of the uh, most consistently associated with reductions in gun violence. Finally, I think because of this focus on history and analogy, some recent innovations may be threatened. And this includes things like um, extreme risk protection orders or, or red flag laws. It's difficult to say how that will be, um, be viewed. Is there a, a good historical analog? It depends how that's implemented and, and considered by courts. Uh, but if those were uh, struck down or reshaped, that would be um, a, a really unfortunate blow to, to um, gun violence prevention strategies. Great, thank you, Alex. Thanks for, for sharing those, those thoughts. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit and, and ask um, some very sort of specific legal questions and I'll direct this to, to Kelly and, and maybe Eric too for this one. Um, 
and this is a multiple question that I'm going to ask that you help unpack. So are there other constitutional rights evaluated using a text history and tradition test? And the question goes on to say, by eliminating second part of the test, the government interest doesn't brew and make treatment of Second Amendment different than First Amendment. Isn't this the case that 1A can be restricted to protect public safety, like not be allowed to shout fire in a theater? So just wondering um, how you, what you would both think about that. Maybe we'll start with Kelly. Sure, thanks, Keisha. For that first question, um, yes. Uh, the Seventh Amendment is evaluated using a text history and tradition test, but it is somewhat unusual. It's also a test that is fairly flexible in its application. And Professor Daryl Miller from Duke University Law School has a really excellent law review article um, discussing this test as it applies to the Seventh Amendment, and also some of the lessons that might be learned for, at the time, the prediction that the court might uh, adopt a text history and tradition test for the Second Amendment. That being said, um, you know, means and scrutiny, which is, uh, you know, depending on how you, um, how you define it, a one of three different types of, of tests that evaluate how closely tailored a law is to achieve a government interest. Um, so typically classified as rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. Um, these tests are ubiquitous across constitutional analysis. It's one of the fundamental things that um, you learn in law school, certainly a big part of what I learned when I was in law school um, as part of my constitutional law courses. Um, and it's also used in First Amendment law, um, which is an interesting thing to consider as the court is consistently comparing the Second Amendment to the First Amendment trying to import some of the principles of First Amendment law to the Second Amendment, which of course uses these tiers of scrutiny in different contexts. There are also um, types of speech that are considered to be unprotected by the Second Amendment, or I'm sorry, by the First Amendment. Um, yelling fire in a crowded theater is one of those sort of um, really common examples that comes from a court case over a hundred years ago called Schenck. Um, other types of unprotected speech include that which is uh, going to incite imminent uh, unlawfulness and violence. Um, there's also cases regarding fighting words. So it's really common for constitutional law to consider uh, different levels of scrutiny for the core of a right and sort of the, the protections within the ambit of that right. Now, after Heller, that was identified that core right as being possession of a handgun in the home for self-defense. So previously when courts were considering laws regulating firearms in public, that was somewhat outside the core of that right and evaluated using intermediate scrutiny, less exacting form of scrutiny than strict scrutiny. Um, so that is a, a quick answer. And actually, Eric was a co-author on two really excellent briefs before the Supreme Court, which delved into this pretty deeply. Great. Eric, do you want to um, add something here? Sure. So I think Kelly provided a great overview. Um, you know, to be sure, hi history has always been important in judicial decision making. It was important in the two-part approach that preceded what, what Bruin set out. The first question of the two-part approach is whether or not this, the Second Amendment came into play at all and deciding whether or not a given weapon counted as an arm tended to be historical. <clears throat> so history did play a role. All judges will say that history matters. And what's so unusual about this Bruin test is that it seems to say that history is the sole determinant of the constitutionality of gun laws pursuant to this uh, historical analogical test. Um, and, and I think that that is quite unusual in constitutional jurisprudence involving individual rights. And, uh, and one of the fears that I have with this test is that it's going to make constitutional law with respect to the Second Amendment increasingly inscrutable and, 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 and hard to follow. Uh, for average Americans and also for those who are working to enact policies. One of the questions that I saw pop up in the Q&A was, what are advocates for modern day policies 
to address modern day gun violence supposed to do with this opinion? And I think it's a really good question. Are, are advocates supposed to all of a sudden uh, shift their focus and their time and their energy away from what might be sound responses to the gun violence epidemic and become armchair historians and try to uh, figure out whether or not a given modern solution to gun violence comports with some historical analog. I think that that would probably be a big waste of time, but it's still, it, you know, it's yet to be seen how exactly this is going to play. And one of the, one of the things that happened in, in the Bruin case, and one of the things that I think is regrettable is that the court is diverging the, the litigation and the, the, the constitutional law focus away from what policymakers are focusing on right now. Whereas before the two inquiries um, were, uh, were, 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 were more similar, um, but now there might be a greater divergence between what policymakers are focusing on and what the courts are focusing on. Great, thank you so much, Eric, for that. And thanks for um, also uh, responding to another question that you saw in the chat. Again, a lot, a lot of really great questions popping up here. Um, I wanted to to turn to Cami to unpack a little bit more the one of the one of the important equity implications I'm hearing of related to Bruin. And you know, people are asking how could the decision affect mass incarceration in in the United States? And for people on who might not see that link, can you explain that a bit too? Absolutely. And, and I also just want to go back to the, the previous question um, about the uh, about history and tradition. And, uh, you know, that question was really about what other decisions um, or what prior analysis has happened. I think that we need to start thinking about what, what will be in the future, because this originalist story, what we're, what we're talking about, and again, what I teach my law students is that this is based on an originalist doctrine, a textual doctrine. And before, when it was, you know, just Anson Scalia, Clarence Thomas, maybe a couple of others, really the balance of the court is tilted. So we're, I suspect we're going to see a lot more decisions in the future. So the questions and the themes that we're answering now with respect to Bruin really are going to have broader implications across um, so many uh, different policies. But with respect to mass incarceration, so yes, again, uh, how, when we're thinking about the, the link between mass incarceration and this uh, opinion, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, black people um, have, are represent about in, in New York represented seventy eight percent of felony gun possession charges. Um, in the state last year alone, um, and they only make up 18% of the population um, compared to 7% um, of, of the prosecutions and 70% uh, of the population for non-Hispanic whites. So when you look again at the racial disparities and who's being arrested, prosecuted, convicted for these gun crimes, um, it's disparately it's um, Black uh, Americans. Now, that does not mean that, that Black Americans are prone to criminality. These we're talking about um, embedded biases in, within the system. And so um, and I'll just use from my own personal experience as a prosecutor in Washington, D.C., uh, prior to Heller, so it was a long time ago, prior to Heller, uh, there were a lot of um, sympathetic uh, defendants, people who were uh, Black uh, uh, Americans, people who were carrying firearms because of their safety or because they had crossed, they had, or a security guard in one jurisdiction and had crossed into Washington, D.C. So uh, I'm very sympathetic to um, to uh, the, the, the plight uh, or to the argument that this decision could in some way decrease mass incarceration. Um, but um, I'm also very skeptical because um, we also know that again, um, black males um, in, in New York in uh, particular uh, died by gunfire um, in a disproportionate manner to, um, to their white counterparts. Um, so that also is a statistic that can't be ignored. And so I think if the court were really concerned about racial equity in general, right, we'd have a lot 
uh, have different uh, decisions. Uh, but I don't think we're going to see. We're not going, we, there are affirmative action cases that will be uh, coming up. And I don't think that we're going to see an overwhelming you know, outpouring of sensitivity from the court um, when it comes to, um, to, to, to race there. Uh, I would point at the, the, the listeners, uh, the participants to um, an article that Joseph Bloker, Rita Siegel, um, uh, that really explores um, because there was, um, again, public defenders uh, kind of came out and uh, lauded this opinion because of the impact that they thought it would have uh, for their clients. Um, and in that article, Joseph uh, Bloker and Rita Siegel really talk about, um, yes, but is doing it at the expense of expanding uh, these gun rights, really the right way to do it. So there are really different ways in which we can uh, we, we can do things and um, expanding um, gun laws uh, may not be the best way to deal with some of the, the racial bias that we have in our criminal justice system. The, the racial bias that we have, again, in my, even in my remarks, I mentioned um, McCleskey versus Kemp, which was a capital punishment case. So these um, biases that we see uh, are embedded, they're institutional, and I don't, one opinion is not going to um, to make the difference here. And particularly with this court, what we're likely to see in this, and going back to the originalist uh, strands, uh, I, I don't think that racial equity is a concern. Great, thank you, Cami. Thanks for unpacking that. I know there's lots of questions. Um, I'll give you an email address at the end if there's if there's um, or people don't already have it for more questions. But let me let me move to another one. Um, and, and maybe Alex or Kelly can respond to this one. You know, one other concern I've heard in response to Bruin is, you know, can you still prohibit firearms in sensitive places like schools or government buildings, or is that not allowed anymore? I can jump in. So um, the court discussed this uh, both at uh, oral argument, it was a, a topic of discussion, um, and also a little bit in the opinions. And, and it seemed like they generally thought that restrictions for sensitive places were still okay, but that they couldn't be too broad. They couldn't be so broad as to effectively declare an entire city to be a, a sensitive place. That said, there was nothing that they said in their opinion, the court said in its opinion, that um, is binding right, on, on this specific issue. And so it's difficult to say exactly how they would evaluate uh, sensitive places moving forward. But I think the short answer for states is that they can continue to regulate sensitive places. Um, and the, the safest way to do so, at least constitutionally speaking, is to um, have a very particular reason for each place that they are restricting. Um, to not act in, in uh, overly broad ways. Yeah, I want to echo what what Alex said about sensitive places and, and the court in Bruin actually kind of expands on the list first articulated in Heller, which originally included schools and government buildings. The majority in Bruin also lists legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses, though they specifically note that they're not aware of very many 18th and 19th century laws relating to sensitive places. So it's really unclear how the doctrine of sensitive places fits in under a text history and tradition test. Um, other courts have speculated that it has something to do with the people who congregate there, uh, vulnerable populations like children and elderly individuals. Um, or the activities that take place there, um, important functions of democracy. So I think it'll remain to be seen exactly how a sensitive places doctrine will develop, but I think it'll be an incredibly important part of this opinion as states are already moving to ban firearms in quote unquote sensitive places. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm, I'm noting that we are coming to the end of our time soon. I can't believe how quickly time has moved. And um, I thought maybe I would sort of end um, with one question I'd love to hear all of you respond to. Um, as you all know, you know, we 
this new federal legislation, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which is really exciting and wondering if each of you can share one thing about that new legislation that you're particularly excited about or interested in watching or something that you feel like has a lot of potential to impact public health, public safety, equity. Um, so maybe I'll start with Cami and then um, I'll go around and call the rest of the people. So Cami. Yes, um, I, I just think that there needs to be more funding for uh, community uh, violence intervention. So um, anything that, that kind of funds uh, creative ways of looking at that that don't have carceral uh, approaches. If we're, if we're getting to a carceral uh, approach, then it's, it's too late. We need to think about uh, prevention. Great, thank you. So prevention, can we go to Eric? What, what about you? So I, th I think that the funding extreme risk protection orders is a, a really interesting aspect of the new legislation. And this will provide incentives for states to consider adopting those regulations. Alex mentioned earlier that there is a question about whether or not these will withstand scrutiny under Bruin um, and, 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 and time will tell, but these are bipartisan reforms. They've been enacted in 20 or so states. And some of the big high profile shootings recently involved so-called red flags before the shooter actually engaged uh, or went to purchase a firearm. And these are very targeted ways to focus on people who are presenting um, signs that they might be a risk to themselves and others and remove firearms, prevent them from acquiring new ones for a short period of time. So it's a targeted approach. It has broad appeal. And I think that it could help to reduce some gun violence. Great, thanks, Eric. Kelly? There are a lot of things to be excited and hopeful about in this in this new bill and the list dwindles as we move from speaker to speaker. So I'll consider um, something that hasn't been spoken about yet, which is the partial closing of the dating partner loophole. So extending the prohibition on possession um, and purchase of firearms to persons convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors against dating partners has, I think, a huge potential um, to save lives as people continue on in longer dating relationships, married at later times, um, we're leaving people behind where we don't cover them with these firearm prohibitions. I would have liked to have seen this extended to include purchase and possession prohibitions for persons under domestic violence protective orders against dating partners. Um, some of the best research that we have shows really significant reductions in intimate partner homicide when those protective orders cover dating partners, but this is a really great first step. Great, thanks Kelly and Alex. So I, I totally agree with what um, the others have said. Uh, and I think those are kind of my, my uh, what I would say would be the three that would have the biggest effect. There are other important pieces in here, you know, including um, some changes to uh, the definition of federal firearms licensee for, for dealers um, and some uh, some changes to background checks for those 18 to 21. But I think what I'm most interested in seeing is whether this is um, you know an effort to kind of let off a little pressure and then we'll go back to not doing much at the federal level or if this is an indication that there may be room for more federal legislation, because we, most of the time we see things at the state level and, and uh, we see a lot of variation at the state level, which selfishly is, is great for research. But from, uh, from a prevention perspective, we don't see, we haven't seen much federal action really at all. Um, so going forward, I'm, I'm most curious to see um, whether this is a promising start or a, a one-time thing. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Special thanks to Kelly, Eric, Cammy, and Alex for such a great conversation. I also want to thank the Center for Gun Violence Solutions at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for sponsoring this webinar. And if you have additional questions, please check the chat. There's an email address there, cgvs at jhu.edu. Please send your additional questions. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being with us and being part of this conversation about how the Bruin case has implicated for the law, for public policy, and for public health. Thank you again. Take care and stay well.